looking at the wise path that God has spelled out for us in his word, specifically in uh, the Proverbs. And uh, I want to begin today by telling you a story. I remember it was in sixth grade, and our class was getting ready to go for a camping trip. It was like the big end of year. This is what we do for fun. It was three days. And every cabin had four kids in it. And everybody was so excited, and there was this huge buzz. And uh, as, as I started looking around and seeing who was going into each cabin, you, you got to pick to be with your friends. Well, I looked at my group of friends, and there was Justin, but he couldn't go to camp because he was in in-school suspension. And then there was Jason, but he also couldn't go to school because he was in in-school suspension. And then there was Jared, but he was also in in-school suspension. I was the only one that was going to my cabin. So I chose to stay with my buddies and voluntarily signed up for three days of riveting in-school suspension. And I watched the clock for three days while all my classmates went to camp, and it was at that young age that I thought to myself, I think I need to rethink my friends. <laughs> and I did. Those were great guys, but that's not how I wanted to spend all the fun times uh, as our class continued to grow through high school and uh, ended up choosing some different guys to put in my closer inner circle. I want to talk about friendship this morning. Surprisingly, when I think of friendship, that's, that doesn't rise to one of the top things in my mind of exciting things to preach on. But when I read through the Proverbs and was deciding what are the themes that run through Proverbs, what was important to the heart of King Solomon, man, he puts a lot of emphasis on friends. So I, I didn't feel like I could be true to the series of Proverbs and leave friends out. And as I did the study, you know what? I am now convinced more than ever the importance of choosing wisely our friends because our friends uh, are going to shape our future potential. Turn with me the, the book of Proverbs, chapter 13. Specifically today, our guiding verse, our, our primary verse is going to be Proverbs 13, verse 20. And this is what I'm going to try to convince you of this morning because I believe Solomon was convinced of this that your potential is determined by your friends. Your potential to develop as the person that God created you to be is determined by the people that you bring into your inner circle. Now this kicks against our way of thinking a little bit in our society because we are fiercely individualistic. We are, are fiercely set that we don't need to depend on anybody. We don't need anybody else. You turn us loose, and we will go be all that we can be. And, and we have grown up in a society that says you can do that all by yourself. In fact, there is much to be said uh, about someone who can go out there and do that all by yourself. So we're, we're, we're in a society where it's not uncommon for people to have zero real friends. Sure, they have 1,374 Facebook friends, but they have zero close friends. They have zero people that they feel comfortable calling at 3 o'clock in the night because they can't sleep and they have a problem. It's not uncommon for people to have no one that they sit down with at a table or at a restaurant or out by a lake, and, and they simply say, these are my struggles, this is how I'm doing, just being open and transparent, where you have another individual outside of your family that truly knows the inner struggles and, and truly participates in your inner joys, someone who is sharing life with you. It's not uncommon at all for people to be completely devoid of those relationships. And it's becoming more and more and more common as our society becomes more and more individualistic, we can hide behind social media. I'm not here to bash social media this morning, but it ha I'm going to talk about it because it has impacted our perception of friendships. Let me simply say this. If you're sitting here this morning and you have very, very few friends or you have no close friends at all, you are missing out on the potential that God has for you. He wants you to have 
good friends. He wants you to choose them carefully. But there's a method to this. And Solomon gives us some principles. We have some some things that we need to do if this is going to become a reality in our lives. Listen to this verse, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. This is a very simple but profound proverb. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but with the companion of fools will suffer harm. The people that you let in to your inner circle, the people that make up your inner circle, your very close friends, will impact the trajectory of your life. It can, rise, it can raise it higher than what you could do on your own, or it can drag it way lower. And King Solomon, a king who puts so much emphasis on wisdom, has a lot to say about how we do this. We must be careful who we make companions with. When we walk with the wise, we become wise. When we become the companion of fools, we will suffer harm. So I'm going to give you this morning three principles, three breakthrough principles. If you will apply these, we're going to do a little bit of examination, potentially some house cleaning, and also some prepping in our own life to be the kind of friend that the Bible calls us to be. We are going to align ourselves in the area of friendships to the wise path. And if we can do this, church, I am convinced God can bless you, stretch you, grow your faith, increase your faith in him, strengthen your walk. He he intends to do all of this through community, through people that we can share life together with. So let's talk about the first principle, breakthrough principle number one. We have to first be a friend to others. If, if, if you're going to be a friend, if you want friends and the right friends, you have to learn how to be the right friend yourself. We're going to turn to my wife's favorite verse in the Bible, Proverbs 17, 17. When I first met her in college, she drew this over everything. It was on her notebooks, in her Bible. It was just her verse. She, loved, she still likes it today. I just asked her last night. I said, man, do you still like that verse? And she does. Proverbs 17, 17, such an easy verse to remember. And so simple, a friend loves at all times. A friend loves at all times. If we're going to open the door to genuine, real, deep, meaningful friendships in our lives, I'm talking about where people, you let them into your world and you get into theirs. We have to be someone who knows how to love. And again, I I, want to emphasize this. If if you don't have this this morning, I, I want you to take a step of faith here. I want to convince you you know, if, if you are a loner, if you'd rather just do things alone, you don't like people getting into your world, you don't like sharing and being vulnerable, I'm just telling you, you, you are not on the wise path. You have selected something outside of God's design and chosen that that's going to be better for you. Okay, is, is it sinful? No, I can't point to a verse that says you're in sin. But is it wise? No, you're, you've become so guarded Maybe things have happened to you in the past, you just don't want to open up, but I'm telling you, you need to open up to other people and let them into your life. Let's rediscover this lost art of friendship. So as as we're looking how to be a friend, let's let's look at a few pointers, okay? Let's let's see what the, the Bible has to say about this. Number one, to be a friend, we must be present. We must be present. Just uh, a few weeks ago, I was observing, I was at a restaurant, and I was observing a table that was uh, a few tables down from me, but it looked like there was four friends, uh, college age, maybe young 20s, and it was the strangest thing, and I know you've seen this before too, but all four of them, they they had their cell phones out, and they were just completely quiet, staring at their cell phones, just, you know, doing this. And, and typing, and I watched them, and that was pretty much the entire time that I was there. That's, that's all they did. They, they were not present there with each other. All right, we, we have to make sure that we're not using social media for our primary platform of friendships. That's not, that's not friendships. That's good communication. It's fun to keep people in the loop. It's not an evil thing, though it can be used for evil. 
Uh, but we have to make sure that that's not what your definition of a friend is. Uh, and, and in fact, here's, here's a uh, very simple commitment that we can make here this morning, all right? Uh, you can repeat after me, church. We're going to make this commitment together. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, let's give this our best shot. I will develop my friendships face to face. All right, let's try that one more time. I will develop my friendships face to face. All that'll serve you well, church. It really will. Those screens can be a wonderful thing, but that's not where you form your friends. That's not how you develop strong relationships. The Bible has something to say about this. Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25. We'll throw that up on the screen for you. This is what it says. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The Bible commands us not to neglect coming together. There is something uh, powerful in presence. When we actually sit down, look each other in the eye, speak truth to one another, encourage one another, challenge one another, that is, this is something that never changes. Even with the development of technology, this never goes away. This verse never becomes obsolete. It says, do not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some. Some people have become hermits behind their cell phones and computer screens. And where it may look like you have many, many friends, if you were honest with yourself, you know that you don't have deep, true friendships. Note the difference between physical presence and emotional presence. We have to be present with the people that we're with. You can't just be there without being there. We've experienced that with people, and we've done it ourselves. You can have a newspaper folded up in front of you, and you might be in the same room as other people, but you're not with them emotionally. You're not connecting with them. You can do that with a screen or anything else, a phone. We, we need to be there. Make the people that you are with the priority. That's, it's that simple. Whoever's in the room with you, when you're spending time with friends and when you're spending time with family, make them the priority. Limit distractions and interruptions. It's, it's just being a friend. Don't be rude. Give them your full attention. So number two, if we're going to be a friend, uh, we must be transparent. We must open up a little bit. There's a great verse in this in James. It's James chapter 5, 16. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Be open with one another. Again, this is becoming a lost art. In, in the day of social media, it has become our mission to convince everybody else that our lives are perfect. If you're going to post a selfie, you take 30 different pictures at different angles, then you go in and tweak it, edit it, take out the wrinkles, puff up the eyes a little bit, lift up the cheeks, and then post that for everybody to see. Look how great I look. You post pictures of your family, you're all smiling. Look so happy. You go on a vacation and you take the pictures in the greatest spots. Look at my life. What an adventure it is. Okay, we're not fooling anybody. You can take a snapshot in anybody's life and capture a smile or some happiness. But guys, we're living through real struggles. And it's important that we be vulnerable with one another so we can help each other through that. Otherwise, we just become fake. And fake people cannot be walking the wise path. That's not what God has called us to. In fact, that's the one thing that drove Jesus nuts is fake people. Let's not become fake people. Let's not become the kind of people that gets under God's skin. You know, we had a testimony here. I, I love this. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to say names again because that's, the, it, that's not the point. Openness is the point. Uh, and we had a, a husband and a wife come up here. Uh, in fact, we're doing this next Sunday. Make sure you're out here next Sunday. We're having a testimony Sunday it's our, for our baptism Sunday. But this husband and wife began to share their struggles. And the husband even talked about his journey with pornography and, and struggle there and how it impacted his growth and development and his marriage and his relationships. And, uh, and, and, and they just the, the couple talked about how God was moving uh, in that area and helping them and, and bringing healing and, and strength. 
And I received so many contacts that week. Number one, people said, I can't believe you guys talk about stuff like that at your church. I've never been to a church that does that. And then they said, that's awesome because I've got some stuff I need to talk about. It became a safe place when they realized that you could open up and share real problems and not have heaping coals of condemnation shoveled on top of you. We had a lot of people reach out and say, yeah, I struggle there too. You guys doing anything? What, what's available? What tips do you have for me? When, when we share our weaknesses, we connect through our weaknesses. All right, I could come up here and give you all my strengths. We're not going to connect that way. But when I tell you where I struggle, those of you who struggle in the same areas, we would quickly begin to form a connection. That's the vulnerability that we bring into a friendship. Now, a friendship, someone in your inner circle, you have to be able to trust because you have to, you, you have to share things that you wouldn't want the entire world to know, but yet you need somebody to look you in the eye and give you some help to walk through that with you, to see the real you and see that they still love you. That is so important. That's why we become so fake on social media. We put the fake you out there, and everybody admires the fake you, but inside you know that's not me, and, and that begins to chip away at your soul. God made us where we need someone who knows the real us to look us in the eye, to know our imperfections, our struggles, and our ugly spots, and say, I just so appreciate you in my life. I just have such a love for you. I want the best for you. I just want to walk through life with you. There is healing for the soul that is willing to do that. But so many of us are not willing to do that. We're convinced we have to put on the, the facade so that people think that we're someone that we're not. So important that we confess our sins to one another. Us Protestants don't do real well with that kind of language. It sounds like a Catholic thing to do, confess your sins to somebody else. I want you to know right here in our New Testament, it says, we are to confess our sins to one another. It doesn't say priest, but it does say to one another. There is healing. When we bring darkness into light, you can find freedom. You know, there's some of us in here in this room that are struggling with sins that are decades old because we've never told another soul. We're afraid of what they would think of us. We've never, we've never disarmed darkness by dragging it into the light. When will you do that? The Bible tells us that we are so wise to be able to find friends, build friendships with people that we can do this with. Proverbs 28.13 says, He who conceals his sin will not prosper. In fact, he's, he's not on the wise path. God can't bless him. If you're concealing sin, he will not prosper. But those who confess them and turn away from them will find mercy. That's God calling people back onto the wise path. Quit, being, quit pretending. We know you all got struggles. I've got struggles. Get onto this wise path. Let people into your life. Talk about them. Encourage one another. And find strength that you simply can't find on your own. Get out of your head that you can live this life on your own. That's not God's design. Can you do it? Yeah, but you'll never be the person that God wanted you to be. You'll never, you'll never reach the potential that God built into you because part of that potential is only tapped through deep friendships. And if we eliminate that from our life, we, we cut off a, a major help that God has given to us. Let's not be fake. Let's be vulnerable. Number three, a friend, if we're going to be a friend, we must know how to handle offenses. If friendships are going to last... We make friendships with real people. And real people are full of problems and imperfections, and eventually they're going to offend you. And how you deal with personal offense will determine whether you can keep someone in your inner circle for very long or not. God wants them to last a long, long time, if not a lifetime. But some of us have to get over ourselves first, be able to deal with, with offenses. And the Proverbs talk two different ways about handling offenses. Uh, the first one is in Proverbs 10, 12. Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Someone with hatred in their heart, they're always going to end up being in arguments. There's always going to be dissension and division and strife. They're not going to be keeping friends for long. 
Because as they become open with one another, as you begin to uh, walk through life together, eventually they're going to offend you and it will break at that point. But we're encouraged here that love covers all offenses. We overlook a friend's faults because according to 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love bears all things. Uh, that's a word that's called forbearance. We don't use it very much. But forbearance means I will put up with your nonsense because I love you. That's what forbearance means. And we've all got nonsense. But if we love each other, we know what our faults are, and we will put up with that. We'll deal with it. Now think about your close friends, the people you really know. They've got their faults, and we don't throw it in their faces, and we don't let it get all under our skin. We have learned to love them. We have learned to let certain things go because it's just who they are because none of us are perfect. So we are to have forbearance, but there's also a time to confront. All right, let me read to you Proverbs 27, 6, and Proverbs 27, verse 9. Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. What a strange verse. And verse 9 says, The sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. This is what separates a friend from an acquaintance. A friend can look you in the eye, and a friend knows when there's a fault that's light and can be overlooked, a fault that just gets under your skin, but in the big scheme of things is not going to bring damage or destruction to that person's life, we let it go. It is our honor to let go and overlook a fault. But a friend also knows when we stumble into the arena of, hey, you know what, we're in sin now. We're, we're not in just a fault. Uh, we're, we're not in just an idiosyncrasy in your behavior. Uh, this, is, this is sin. And if you continue down this path, you are going to suffer because of it. So because I'm your friend, I'm going to look you in the eye and say, I love you, this is wrong, and you need to change it. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Now, only a close friend can do that. An acquaintance would not dream of doing that. Unless you're one of those people that just likes to point out the faults of others. But typically, typically you're, you're just letting that stuff go, and then what, we talk behind their back maybe. That's how it gets out there. But a real friend is going to go right to you. They're not going to air your faults. They're not going to talk about it with someone else. They're going to say, friend, I see an issue here that you need to settle or it's going to impact your life. It's going to hurt your family and your marriage. And you can't continue like this. And true friends, that will wound at first. There might be a day or two of yeah, maybe a little bit of distance. You hurt me with that. But then, then the friend begins to realize there's truth to this. And I know that they have my best interests in mind. And, and I just need to heed this counsel a little bit. I need to internalize this and, and think and pray over what was said to me. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. We need friends like that in our lives. And if we won't let them in, we are missing that. God has designed us where people who are close to us need to speak truth into us. And if you don't have that built in, if you've chosen the road of isolation, then you're going to have glaring faults that everybody sees but you, and nobody is close enough and loves you enough to tell you about them. And it's going to cause you to suffer. Friends love enough to be honest when honesty stings. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Finally, number four, if we're going to be a good friend, Friends are committed. We are committed to one another. I'm going to go back to where we started this one. Proverbs 17, 17. Uh, a friend loves at all times. We must be committed. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Unconditional love is involved. Unconditional commitment is involved in the types of friendships we're talking about this morning, the inner circle. Friends don't walk away when things get messy. Friends continue to love one another. Now, let me say this. This is who you must be if you're going to experience these kind of deep relationships in yourself. You must be a friend before you're going to get one. Some people just sit and mope around and say, I don't have any close friends. 
and you just wait for someone to friend you, but you're in a stupor moping around, nobody's going to want to friend you like that. You need to start having these characteristics before you're going to have close friendships so that people would want to be your friend. So that leads us to breakthrough principle number two. Breakthrough principle number two. Choose your friends wisely. If we're going to have this level of devotion and commitment and love, if we're going to have this kind of investment in another individual, please choose your friends wisely. Like our verse said at the very beginning, if you walk with wise, the wise, you're going to be wise yourself. But if you walk in the counsel of fools, you are going to suffer. Therefore, be selective about who you let into the inner circle. All right. Now, I have to be careful as I talk about this. I'm not talking about looking down on others. I'm not, I'm not talking about becoming a judgmental Christian. I'm talking about you exercising wisdom to say who you're going to bring into so close that you open up your world to, uh, that you share, that you listen to counsel from, these types of things. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 30, 20, 26, 12, 26, uh, in the NIV. I love how the NIV states it. It says, the righteous choose their friends carefully. King Solomon, those are good words. Choose your friends carefully. It's, it's the same advice I'd give to my kids. Choose your friends carefully, or you'll end up sitting in suspension with your friends while everybody else goes to camp, right? Choose your friends carefully, or you might be in jail while everybody else is enjoying their families. Choose your friends carefully, or you may end up addicted to substances when everybody else is experiencing freedom and, and different, different challenges in their lives. Choose your friends and your influences carefully. It's not just Solomon who says this. Listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15.33. We'll throw that up on the screens for you again. It says this, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Other translations say bad company corrupts. That simple. Bad company company corrupts. Therefore, choose your friends carefully. You cannot live a God-honoring life when your friends are constantly dishonoring God. That's truth, church. You cannot do it. You cannot honor God in your life when your inner circle is constantly dishonoring God. In fact, that's why we're told in 2 Corinthians 6.14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial or deceit? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are a temple of the living God. We are not to be unequally yoked, church. We use that a lot for marriage, but it goes, it goes beyond that. It's, it's even in friendships. You must make sure that the people you let into your inner circle are first and foremost honoring God with their lives. If they don't have the fear of God as their baseline, how do you know if they're giving you wise counsel or not? According to what? According to whose standards? According to CNN or Fox News, right? Uh, they're just going to listen to the culture and wherever they tune in, that's where they're getting their, their smarts from. Yikes. All right, that's not what you need. You need someone with a fear of God, with that wise baseline that says, I can distinguish right from wrong, truth from lies. God says, don't be unequally yoked. Now, I'm just going to do a side note here. Now, church, come on. Especially, especially in relationships. Y'all quit doing that, okay? okay quit Cut out the relational evangelism. I met this cute guy, and he doesn't go to church, or you know, he's not into God much, but I think as I get closer to him, I'll be able to bring him that way. Yeah, okay, we don't flirt to convert, all right? That's not the way this goes. We, we need to be looking for people who are chasing after God before we even consider going down that road. I promise you, you're going to get hurt when you play that game. Because what that leads to is we become unequally yoked in marriage. And church, that's such a painful place to be at times. 
I'm not saying people who are not following Christ with all their heart are bad people. But I'm saying when you have a Christ follower who loves God and is chasing after him, and they're living with someone who's chasing after something else, and you're constantly trying to pull them, there's this tension, constant tension in your marriage, and it hurts. It hurts. Don't, don't go that. I don't care how cute she is or how good he looks. Uh, none of that matters. You need Christ as the foundation in your relationships. And uh, um, I, I also want to say this while we're talking about inner friendships. For, you, for those of you who are married, men, your inner circle is not, does not include women. And women, your inner circle, the people that you go pour your heart out to and you're completely transparent and vulnerable and you sit down alone across the table with the meal, that women, that's not a man, okay? You, 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 do you have the freedom in Christ to do that? Sure. Can you do that and honor your spouse? No, you cannot. No, you cannot. If I took a woman in this church, and there are great women in this church, Chasing after Jesus, man, I'm so proud of the women we have in this church. But if I were to select one and just say, you know what, I want you in my inner circle. I mean, I just really want to open up to you. And you look like you just have a lot of wisdom. So let's, let's go sit down and get a cup of coffee and let's just start that relationship. There is no way I can do that and honor my spouse. And I can promise her, well, we're just friends, and she loves the Lord, I love the Lord. We're not, I mean, it's nothing impure. Look, even that can be true. I'm still dishonoring my spouse. If, if, if that friendship is going to exist, it's with my spouse and only with my spouse. That's the way that you do that, but not alone, not alone. Don't go down that road. That leads to, even between mature Christians, that leads to bad things. Be wise. Be wise, church. So as we examine our inner circle, and I need to do this quickly, we may need to redefine some relationships. There are times when you look at your inner circle and you have to make a decision, you know what? Solomon is telling me through the, the counsel of the Holy Spirit that if I'm walking with fools, I've got pain ahead in my journey. But if I'm walking with the wise, uh, there is there, there's good for me to benefit from this. So let's look at the inner circle. Number one, watch out for overly negative people. I mean extremely negative people. Always criticizing, always complaining, always down. Uh, watch for what's coming out of their mouths. Women, if you're hanging around other women who are always trash-talking and bashing men, men are such selfish, sexist pigs, da, 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 you're going to have a hard time improving your marriage when all that's going on. I'm being serious. you got to be careful. Men, if you're in a circle, every time a, an attractive woman walks by, you know, the eyebrows are going up, we're Googling and gawking and saying, oh, you can look, but you can't touch. You better be careful because what you're letting into your inner circle is not going to be healthy for your marriage. Job 31.1, I've made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look lustfully at a woman. Those are the kinds of people you need to be around. And if your inner circle is constantly tempting you to sin, then it's time to redefine some relationships. Your inner circle should be made up of people who fear God and drag you that direction. And if they're constantly going the other way, they're constantly tempting you to sin, whether it's with alcohol or substances or, or, or movies or uh, I don't know what it is, but you know that it's wrong. And they're constantly, continuously, this is part of your friendship. It's time to redefine the relationship. It is. You can still be friends, but that's not inner circle stuff, guys. Your inner circle needs to be people who will counsel you well. Also watch out for conflicting values. When you have someone in your inner circle who who quickly deviates from the word of God and has a different set of values that they apply that that drives their life. I remember sitting and talking with a a mature Christian man that I looked up to in my youth. And, And he gave me the counsel when it came to finding a wife. He says, look, I know the Bible that talks about marriage and about purity and about all that stuff. But he says, listen, you don't go to a a car lot and and just purchase the car before you give it a test drive. Now, this was a guy instructing me in relationships 
who had been a Christian for decades and was looked up to in his church. But he had taken the counsel of the word of God and says, you know what, that's just old-fashioned stuff that doesn't apply anymore. Here's what you need to do. And gave counsel and shared values that were against the word of God. If you've got that going on in your inner circle, that's not going to bring you closer to the Lord. That's not going to strengthen your walk. You need to redefine the relationship. I'm not saying I'm all better than you. I'm not saying you're a horrible person. I'm saying I don't need you in the close parts of my innermost heart giving me the kind of counsel that you're giving me. I need to redefine the relationship. It's Solomon that says this is what wise people do. We, we need to be careful about this. But let, me, let me speak really fast to those of you who are coming out of addiction. You guys have to do this big time. If you are going to break free of an addiction... You have to look at your inner circle, and you are going to have to do some hard redefining of relationships. And you are going to have to look at friends that you have had for a long time and say, I cannot continue to hang out with you. It's not because I'm better than you, but I am not strong enough, and I cannot allow you to drag me back into this. I cannot allow you to pull me back down. And maybe after I get out, I can get strong enough on my own that maybe one day I'll be able to pull you out of this too. But I'm just telling you, I cannot let you do this in my life. God is telling me that I need to, to strengthen myself with people who are going to help me get out of this, and it's not you. And if you can't, coming out of addiction, friends... If you can't do that, your chances of success are, are so minimal. You have to redefine the relationships. It's tough. I know it's tough. It sounds cruel. It's not. It's wise. There are times in our lives when we have to redefine that inner circle and we have to make some hard decisions. So this brings me to our final principle, which is very fast. Principle number three. Once you have done this, you've become a friend and now... Uh, you, you are uh, examining your inner circle and redefining some relationships. Now we have to welcome the counsel of wise friends. We have been selective of who gets into our inner circle. I'm going to turn to Proverbs 27, 17. Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. This is why we choose friends who are already on the wise path. This is why we choose friends who fear the Lord. This is why we choose friends who demonstrate integrity in their lives. This is why we choose friends who show they have self-control to some level with their anger and with their fleshly appetites. This is why we choose friends who are a good model in their home. I'm talking about inner circle friendships, guys. Because once we find a friend like that, you found a treasure. And you open up your life, and they open up theirs, and you begin to sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron, and the potential that is within you has just gone up about 10 notches. Because as you do this over time with these individuals, God is going to... Uh, put you on the fast track for growth and wisdom. This wise counsel is hard to find in our culture. And unless you intentionally seek it out, unless you follow what we've learned today in the Proverbs, it isn't going to happen all by itself. But if you'll do this, this is a really fast way to get on the wise path, getting the right people in your life. I wish I had more time because I, I want to warn you against, listen, Jesus, he was a friend of sinners, right? I'm not telling you just to draw a hard line in the sand and say, I've got four friends and no more. I ain't talking to all the other uh, hypocrites and sinners out there. Don't become that judgmental Christian that the rest of the world can't stand. Don't do that. I'm saying the few that get in deeply into your life, that you receive counsel and correction and instruction from, those are handpicked extremely carefully examined before you let them in there. And once they're there, you listen. You receive their counsel. You don't dismiss what they have to say. You still examine it with the word of God. They're not flawless, but you be careful. And for other friends, just like Jesus, absolutely. Jesus was a friend of sinners, but he still had his boundaries. He still had his inner three, and then he had his 12 disciples. And there were many times he looked at the crowd and said, nope, 
Uh, not for me. You guys are after the wrong stuff. He showed wisdom in this area. Church, if we'll do this, if we'll show wisdom and go across the grain of culture in this particular area, and we don't let social media warp what God gave to us as a gift of good, solid friendships, some of us could really be launched into a great direction from simply putting today's counsel into practice. God wants to bless your life, but you have to be on the wise path. Choose your friends carefully. Be a friend to them and receive their counsel into your life. God can do some pretty amazing things here. Some of us, we need to take some pretty big steps here. Some of us, we need to go get some friends. We need to be a better friend. And some of us really need to examine our inner circle as it is right now and ask God what we need to do to get into a place where he can bless us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the gift of friendship. And we don't often give it a lot of thought and examination like we did today, God. But boy, you've, you've filled Scripture with it. This is an important subject. And God, I pray for those right now who are struggling because their friends are the wrong friends. And it's not that they're bad people, but the influences are dragging us back into places where we're getting stuck. And, and we really need to hear this and apply this, God. God, I pray that you would bless Cornerstone as you help us to become a person who walks this path of deep, satisfying friendships, who dare to be vulnerable in front of another person. Help us to face our fears, God, of what someone else might think when they find out we're not perfect. Help us to quit being fake. God, I really think you can bless us. Father, help those in addiction coming out of that lifestyle with people all around them that they love, that need help too. Boy, give them wisdom, God, about how they handle those friendships and how they make some breaks that need to take place and how they make new friendships that need to take place. Give them wisdom, God. Be with our youth who are making friends now that will determine the course of their high school and college years and, and to a great degree the outcome and the trajectory of their life to follow. Help us to understand how important friends really are. Father, I, I pray as we apply this that you would bring us in alignment with the wise path. We pray this in your precious son's name. Church, if you would just for a moment, before we sing this morning, I want to give an opportunity. I know we've talked about friendship all morning, but as we gather here this morning, no matter what topic we're talking about in Scripture, there's one that's at the forefront of God's mind. Friendship has a lot to do with it. God defined friendship with Abraham, a man of great faith. God has created you to be in relationship with him. God wants to call you friend, to know you at that level. And until you come to Christ at that level, it doesn't matter all the changes you make in your life. Nothing matters until the blood of Christ has been applied to you. Are you a friend of God? Could you say that this morning? Do you walk with him? and talk with him? Do you have a relationship with him? Beyond just knowing about the stories of the Bible, do you know him like this? We're called to. We must. If you're going to be the kind of friend that God is calling you to be to others, it starts here with the fear of God being instilled in your heart. Church, before we close today, examine your own heart. If you were to die today, do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you would spend eternity with God because you have a relationship with him? Are things right between you and him? Have you asked God to forgive you of your sins and placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Have you cried out to him to save you from your sin and made a commitment in your life to follow him and his word and his counsel above everything else? Are you pursuing Christ with your life this morning? Because there is where your confidence in eternal life lies. Outside of that, we have no confidence. As you're examining your heart right now, and God is too, if that's a decision that you need to make this morning, 
Right now, would you just place your hand up in the air so that I can pray for you? I won't embarrass you in any way. But this is so important. This friendship is the one that you've got to have right. This morning, you just slide your hand up, and I'm just going to say a prayer this morning. Help you make that decision. Anyone here? Well, Father, at this time, no hands are going up, so I'm going to just take the word that you've given to us. Help us to be the friends that you're calling us to be. And help us to build that inner circle where we receive godly counsel from people who fear the Lord. Would you bless us with that, Father? Thank you for the gift of friendship. We sure love you, Lord. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.